it is Wednesday afternoon, July 28th, I think. I didn't think to look. 29th. 29th. I've lost a whole day. <laughs> that calendar is moving rapidly. Thank you for correcting me. It is July 29th, and we are picking up. We have finished Daniel's 70th week. I hope you'll remember some of that. That will help us in our questions today. But we have a first question of what is meant by the synagogue of Satan. When we taught this in Revelation, we looked at it, but it those of us who were not there or who don't have great perfect recall <laughs> are happy to go over it again. So in short, what is meant in Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3 when we have the reference to the synagogue of Satan? The church of Smyrna and the church of Philadelphia, both are the ones that have to deal with it. In short, what I think it is, and there are, um, you know, I, I'm open to other suggestions, but I think this one makes the most sense and feels fits in the best, that in short, there were unbelieving Jewish people who were persecuting the Christians during that era. Even the Roman persecution was somewhat to appease the Jewish authorities. We saw that with Pontius Pilate when he tried to appease who was over him, Rome, and the people. And we saw it with Paul's imprisonment was to satisfy um, the, the authorities um, of the Roman government, Felix, Festus. So we see this was going on. During the first century, throughout the Roman world, the early Christians, and I'll call them that even before they were called Christians, that they were part of, it was called the way. And that was a reference to Yochanan, John 14, 6, when Yeshua said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So when they were saying that they were of the way, they were saying they were of Yeshua. That's what they were called. The word Christian wasn't there yet. And in fact, the first time Christian was given, it was derogatory. It was not a compliment. But we know time has changed. That's why we have to go back and look in context, get our answers in context. So at this time, the early believers, that's the safer way to put it, the early believers were Jewish. The first round of believers in, in what becomes the church were the Jewish people. The Talmudim, that were followers of Yeshua Jesus were Jewish. So at first, they continued on in the synagogue and they were accepted as if they were just another sect. Remember I said they're called the way. There was the, um, I'm thinking of it in English, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Gnostics. There were different groups of believers in different ways and for a little while, they just uh, allowed these believers to continue on in synagogue. The trouble came in when these believers would not continue with the sacrificial system. They knew that Yeshua was the sacrifice the Lamb of God, that he had given the perfect sacrifice of himself, that now there was no need to sacrifice lambs anymore, that there was one sacrifice given forever. And they know that uh, they could not take part in that part of the synagogue practices. Well, for the Jewish unbelievers, this was not acceptable. So if they were not going to participate, then they were not welcome in the synagogue anymore. And they started, uh, uh, what's the word? Where they, they make them go out. They started, uh, anathemizing is too strong, but they, they excommunicated them. They started pushing them further and further out. Well, as the believers came out from the synagogue, they were now no longer under the protection that Rome had given to those of the synagogue. They allowed the Jewish people to be exempt from certain Roman religious practices because they were not Roman. They were Jewish. So they just considered all of this a sect of Judaism and they were tolerating it pretty much for the sake and purposes that they wanted the people to not rise up in insurrection. They wanted the people to be a calm enough comfortable enough that they would accept the Roman rule without it being constant fighting. So when these Christians came out, these early believers came out from under Judaism, they now no longer were welcome in the synagogue and they were being denounced by the Jewish leadership. Well, the Roman religion also was not welcoming to them because they also had practices that these believers would not do. And so the, the believers found themselves out from under an umbrella of protection. Now, sadly, but honestly, it starts with the Jewish leaders of the, the 
synagogue of Judaism, I'll put it that way, the Jewish leaders of Judaism who started the persecution at this time against these believers. So when you realize they were Jewish and they gathered together, well, what's a synagogue? A synagogue is a gathering together. Now, the synagogue that we call today is the synagogue that's the house of prayer, where they went to pray. But in essence, this name has been given that they were the synagogue, they were a gathering of Satan, not of Yeshua, because they weren't following Yeshua, they were following their false traditional beliefs in Judaism that was rejecting Yeshua Jesus as Messiah. So to differentiate them from the Jews who were believing, because we can't say that they didn't also have a synagogue, a gathering, we just gave it a new name, called it the church, then they, it was called the synagogue of Satan. So originally, the distinction is going to be made up of the Jewish people who were following Satan because they're persecuting those who are following Yeshua. Sha'ol Paul was one. He was persecuting the believers. He was instrumental in Stephen's death, the first martyr. He was going about getting all he could, men and women, throwing them into prison or sing to their death. He would have been of the synagogue of Satan. But we see how he came into the synagogue of Yeshua. Just again, given another name, a name that, that became more widely accepted because it's going to include a far greater body of Gentiles and Jewish people and it's not going to look like the synagogue and it's called the church. So that's really how the name came about. Let me show you that, and, and we would say it was the true people of God being persecuted for their belief in Messiah and that versus the, those who were again, of the synagogue of Satan. Sha'ol Paul makes a distinction between ethnic Jews and faithful Jews in Romans 9 and verse 6, which says not all who descended from Israel are Israel. So in other words, Sha'ol Paul was saying there's a big circle that's called Israel, and that would be all the Jewish people, but not all of them are true Israel. Not all of them are that spiritual note together. They're ethnically Jewish, but they're not spiritually one in belief of Jewish Messiah. That correlates with Romans chapter 2, which you may want to look up, verses 28 and 29, because this also gets misunderstood. Romans 2, 28 says, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor in circumcision, that which is outward in the flesh. But, verse 29, he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. So in these verses, Shaul Paul's bringing out very clearly that it's something that happens inwardly, and that those who were called the true Jews were the ones who were spiritually circumcised, who had the, the flesh of their heart cut, who had accepted Messiah as Savior, who were not going by the external letter of the law, but going by the inward heart, and had been given that new heart of flesh, promised to them by the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 31, where God said that he would make a new covenant, and he would put a heart of flesh, not a heart of stone, into their hearts. This does not open the door to say that you, everybody's Jewish who comes to believe in Yeshua Jesus. You can't change your ethnicity. You cannot change what you were born. But spiritually, you can come into that family. The same way they came into the Commonwealth of Israel when they believed in, the, in what you call Old Testament, I call original covenant time, it's that same way. Um, let me give you another proof of what, how I'm saying this. Both of these churches that face the persecution, we, I've already told you, chapter 2 and chapter 3 in Revelation, and they were in that first century AD, they we're, we're looking, uh, Revelation was written in about 96 AD, so we're looking at close to the end of that first century. But if I take you and go with me to Yeshia, Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 14, I want you to notice the similarity, although there is one difference that I'll bring out, but I want you to notice the similarity of what was happening that was being talked about here. In chapter 60, it starts out with God telling the nation of Israel, Rise, shine, your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Behold, darkness will cover the earth, deep darkness the peoples, but the Lord will rise upon you, 
and his glory will appear unto you. We know this was speaking prophetically of his first and his second coming to the land of Israel. But we know speaking of Messiah's return. Now drop down to verse 14. It says, The sons of those who afflicted you will come bowing to you. When, when Isaiah was given this prophecy of the coming of Messiah, Israel was in a bad place. They were going into captivity. They were in captivity. Assyria is rising. And Israel is diminishing because of her disobedience. She had gone into idolatry. She was not coming back at the call of the prophets. And God finally had to allow the ten northern tribes to go off into captivity in Assyria. So for Isaiah to write that the children of those who are oppressing you, the descendants, it's going to take time. It's not going to happen in our generation. But there's going to be a time when they will come bowing down before you. All who despise you will bow down at your feet. What is being said is the, the Gentile armies, the world that was at enmity with Israel, one day would be bowing in subjection to Israel, would recognize Israel as head nation, which means they'll be recognizing Yeshua Jesus as Lord. And that does not mean that they're doing it with the heart that's changed, but they have to admit God is in control. He has set up his kingdom. We have to bow. As the scripture says, every knee will bow to the name in above all heaven. In Isaiah's day, it was unbelieving Gentiles that would come and bow at the feet of the believing Jews. In Revelation, we have almost an opposite. We have unbelieving Jewish people who are going to be brought to that place of humbleness and in, in essence bow to the God of the believing Jews. But we know that it's more than just the believing Jews because in the church body it is believing Jews and Gentiles. So that's why there's a slight difference in Revelation. But my point in bringing all this out is it does not open the door to anti-Semitism. And this is one of the tripwires. There are those who will say bad Jews, they rejected Messiah, they deserve whatever they get, and we are not going to love them, we are not going to help them, we are not going to side with them, we're going to come against them. That feeds right into the BDS movement of today, which is to boycott, diversify, and sanction Israel. That goes right with the, the world uh, court, uh, I can't think of the name of it, but the world court, where right. Israel, hey, thank you, where Israel is constantly being brought up on charges of inhumanity. Well, hello, even the, the those who are Arabs live in a land without being persecuted. And if you go into the Arab countries, you go to Assad of Syria, who's wiping out villages. News shows us women and children suffering from the gases that he let go. There is your abuse. But Syria is not brought up on charges. Assad's allowed to go on his way. And Netanyahu is brought up as, um, what do they call it, apartheid. And it's not apartheid. Anyone who has been in in Israel anytime knows. Israeli Arabs have position in the Knesset. They have a right to speak. There are those who made it very clear, I think it's 70% of the Israeli Arabs in the disputed areas say if there is a ruling that comes down that puts us under the authority of the Arab countries rather than Israel, we will move. And where are we going to move? We're going to move into the Israeli section that we have a better life under Israel than we would under our own people. So if I sound like I'm on my soapbox, I am, because anti-Semitism is on the rise. It's on the rise in America, it's on the rise in France, it's on the rise in Germany, you name it, and it's coming up more and more. There is a hatred that is being um, stirred up. There, I have heard it already on uh, internet connections, social media that goes out all over, there are cartoons, etc., that are blaming the Jews for COVID. How they can manage that one? They twist the truth. I am serious. I wish I weren't, but I am. So this is why I'm not giving you any room to open the door to an anti-Semitic teaching that says these are bad Jews and we should annihilate them or we should persecute them. There's never room for that. For those who are not in sync with the Lord Messiah, we pray for them, Jew or Arab, Gentile. Whatever, you know, this is where we should stand. And what's happening in chapters 2 and chapters 3 that I have showed you when I taught those chapters, there were specific eras of time that we can see as we move down the line. 
Those churches are in order, and what we see was anti-Semitism that was going on at the time, persecutions that were going on at the time, in very real places, in Smyrna, in Philadelphia. That's why they spoke to it and had to deal with it. This was happening in first century Rome, and it gives no room for a hatred today of the Jew. The same way I hear and hate that uh, the Jews killed Christ, so we should get rid of them. And yet, that's the teaching that's out there today. And it makes it very hard for the Jewish person to understand that becoming a believer in Yeshua does not make you a traitor. That's what I have been called. That's how I've been treated. That's a, it's a reality today. And it comes out of the pit of hell. So forgive me if I'm on my soapbox, but you're hearing a Jewish believing in Yeshua heart speak. And I can't stay silent. We need, as a body, to rise up against that kind of hatred and counter it because our God is a God of love. Yeshua says even to love our enemies. I have to work on that. I don't love a Hitler. But I tell the Lord, I know you do. I, my hat's off to you. I want to be in line with you, but you got to work with my human flesh a little bit more because in my humanity, I don't see how I can love. I have to see them as... Someone so in need of, of my God, my God of love. But I'm a work in progress, so I'll admit on that. Okay, so, yes, Pam, question. Yeah, the, the Jews that believed in Jesus didn't kill Jesus. It was the ones that didn't believe in Jesus. It wasn't even them. It was the it sins was of both. the world. It was Jew and Gentile, and it was actually the, the Lord laid down his life himself. Okay. He said, no man takes my life from me. It was mm -hmm. Yeshua, Jesus willingly sacrificing his life, which was the whole reason why he came. That was his plan. And yes, there were opposing unbelieving Jews who were crying out for crucifixion, just as there were opposing Gentiles who were crying out. And crucifixion was Roman. If they had gone by Jewish standard, he would have been stoned. He wouldn't have been crucified. So that shows you it was not the Jews in control. But none of us have a right to put the blame on anyone else except all of us, human kind together. We're all guilty of the need for his death and hallelujah that he cared and loved so much that he willingly laid down his life. And he took it up again to love even those who are still rejecting him, even those who are full of hatred, even those like a hit. That's God. That's certainly not human love. But wasn't it the ones that didn't believe in Jesus that said, let his blood be on our hands and our children's hands? That yes. was not the Jews that believed in Jesus. No. That was the ones that did not believe yes, in Jesus. Yes, the ones who said... And they were the ones that more or less killed Jesus, I think, the and the Romans. Well, they were the ones who were calling for it. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the ones who did not believe and were saying, you know, even if we're wrong, let it be on us and on our children. Mm -hmm. And that was a terrible statement to make, but that was the, the logic of thinking back then was constantly how the sins are passed down on the generations of the children, and we still see it to this day. If you have an alcoholic parent who suffers the consequences, the children. It is passed down through the generation. But it is not something that there are those who say, oh, well, there's generational curses and I'm under them and I can't get out from under them. <laughs> no. My God is greater. And he can break anything, no matter what the cycle, no matter how long. No. And I do not believe that we have a God who allows things to happen just for generations because of that. No. He is in there intervening interceding and bringing changes. We yeah. see the cycles broken when one comes often. to Messiah, our Savior. I hear that often. Yes, I do too. And it's almost an excuse. I hear it often, yeah. you know, and that's what Arlie was saying. We do hear it often. I think that, that they hide behind it and they make it as an excuse for why they do what they do. No, I give no room for that. If God's powerful enough to, to save you, he's powerful enough to break whatever is binding you. And remember, we've gone through how even in prison you can be free. Well, you can be free and imprison yourself by hiding under those, those bonds that uh, the Lord died for, broke off, and gave you 100% freedom. He didn't give you 
salvation and say, oh, but there's a chain attached. Mm -hmm. You don't go with salvation with a, a ball and chain around your ankle. It's all cut off and you are free. And we have seen the absolute transformation of people who have changed from the way they were. And it was genetically there, it was heredity, it was um, learned, it was in their family, but total change at the generation that accepted the Lord, not continuing on. So. But don't you think that's why they've suffered so much, because they've denied the Messiah? Why they've had to suffer all these years? Israel has always suffered because of rejecting the Lord. Right. All the way before that first generation. Why was Israel and going why can't into... why they wake up and see that? And, and why can't accept they re... the Messiah? Pam's yeah. asking, why can't they wake up and see that and accept the Messiah? Well, Rebellious give, it a, see, give it a chance to see if their life don't get a little better. You know? <laughs> She's saying, give it a chance to see if their life gets yeah, a little better. They, 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 you nothing's have to... changed for them. They've nothing but suffered. So if they change and accept the Messiah and see if their life doesn't get better. You have logic on your side, but here's the problem. They have to crawl over many hurdles. You're asking them to go to the side of those who in that name have persecuted them, in that name have killed them. Why would you go trust somebody that you think their ancestors were killing you? See, that to them, if you are Gentile, you are Christian. So Hitler's a Christian. If I join Christians, I'm joining Hitler's camp. That's how they see it. They have to be taught the difference between a Gentile and a Christian, that the two names are not synonymous. And if you cannot break that down, they're not going to be willing to even look at believing because they think they're joining the camp of those who hate them. And it's very easy to still see today because in the name of the cross today, they're still being told you deserve death because you rejected the Messiah. Well, why should the Jews of today suffer the, the, that fate of those who they had, you know, lived 2,000 years before they did? How many of us would like to go through our ancestral, um, whatever you call it, genealogy? And pick somebody 2,000 years ago and then say your life today is based on what that person did back then. You know, there's there's no reasoning here, but the Jewish people are taught such a, a hatred from the Christian. Now, it's not right, it's not true, and the true Christian loves them. But remember how we have here the true Jews that were um, the, the true believers, and we've got the Jews who were the synagogue of Satan. Well, today you have the true believers who love, and you have the fake believers who, in the name of the Lord, are holding a cross in one hand and a sword in the other, and telling the Jew, you bow down to our God, which to them is a false God, which goes right against the first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And they were willing to even give their own lives up. They were willing to be martyred to not go against the God that they believed in. So there's a lot that so complicates they believe in a different God than we do? The they Jewish believe people? that the Christians believe in a different mm -hmm. God. They oh. believe in the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, well, the, the God of Isaac, too, and though. the God of Jacob. Yes, that is the God we believe in. But they hear us talk about our God, and we call him Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now, we know Jesus and God are one, mm -hmm. but they see two different. Oh, then you Jews, you actually worship two gods. And then mm -hmm. if you throw in the Holy Spirit, oh, you're actually worshiping three gods <laughs> because they don't understand the triunity. Oh and then they look at Jesus as a human. They don't look at him as deity. As he's teacher. not God. He's a good teacher. teacher. He's a good rabbi. Yeah, he did yeah, good yeah. things, but he's but not God. Not, and even when we're reaching Jewish people, we come through obstacle after obstacle. One of the last obstacles we come through is getting them to be able to get to the point that they don't say he's just a Messiah, but they see him as the Messiah, the Son of God, deity with God. When they get that ding, 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 then they come in and they're a completed Jew and their, their faith is there. But they have to be brought along to see and understand that because you Christians, you have Jesus, we have God. There's even a book out against people like me who is called, You Take Jesus, I'll Take God. And it tells the Jewish people how to stay away from people like me because I'm poisoned. 
And they try to say I'm not Jewish. Well, Is hello. When did I become Jewish? Did I become Jewish when I was bat mitzvah? No, I was Jewish before I was 13. Did did they become yeah, Jewish when they were bar mitzvah? <laughs> oh, uh, I wasn't bar mitzvah. Oh, but you're Jewish and I'm not. <laughs> See, there's a lot of argument that has to, and, and it's it's friendly argument. I don't mean that in the wrong way, but there's a lot of breaking down, mis teachings. There's misunderstandings. There's so they the would lies be of the denying people. their God if they accept His Son Jesus. Yes, because that would be like I accept you, Rachel, but I don't accept your child if you have a child. Right, right, and they That's don't see. That's how they're doing God. Yes, and they That's very much. That's kind of slapping God's face, really. Right, and see, they yes. very much do not accept the virgin birth, and they don't accept oh, that they God don't accept has a son. Virgin birth no, either. no. If they did, then they could see He's God. Oh. But see, they don't see that. They do not believe in that. So this person is not equal with God, and they're going to worship the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, we know we worship that same God. That's why you can come into our services on a Saturday because the Jewish people worship on Saturday. That's our Shabbat, our, our covenant sign between God and us. And they will hear us bring out the Shema. Adam, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, the most revered prayer of all. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And they'll say, see, he's one God. That's all we worship. When you bring in this Jesus, you're bringing in a false god and will have no part. We have to show them, even from their Shema, that there is room to have a God who can be divided, who shows us the personalities of the Son and the Spirit also. But even though we cannot fully understand, we don't worship three gods, we worship one. Because remember, there are three in one, like an egg, yolk, white, Shell. Sure. The problem is those three aren't equal parts, and our God is three equal parts. But we have to accept some by faith. The creation of the world. There are those who want to believe it, it, it happened via evolution. They have to believe that by faith, that there was a river bank, there was slime on the river bank, there was a bang, there was a sudden division, there was a sudden male or female, and go on down the line. But they deny that that's by faith. Well, they cannot give the proof of it. And any proofs that they come up with, there are counters that show what's right, what's truly right and what's wrong. We know that we cannot understand how God created out of nothing. We have to take that by faith. But God proves it to us all the time in the fact that he keeps it in order, in the fact that he does not lose control, that there is such an orderliness to this universe. How is that staying in order? And if man is getting better, like evolutionary process shows, then why is our world getting worse? And why are we doing such damage even to our environment, let alone to our human beings, that if it continues on this path, we'll go to destruction? But there's a lot. There's a lot. This is the apologetics of our faith. This, this is a prayer of Galatians 3, 28. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ. And then the next verse is in the next verse is in that that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham, who are his parents in God's promise in the prophecy. And I give you a whole Bible lesson on Galatians 3 that she just read. <laughs> Um, it's talking about how we're all one, if you couldn't hear her, how we're all one in the Lord. What else did it say there in the end, the last verse? Uh, that you are his heirs and God's his heirs. promise that Abraham belongs to you. Yeah, his heirs, you get the promises of Abraham, we're made joint heirs with Messiah, and we're not Jew and Gentile, male and female, um, slave and free, you know, that we're all one. Now, you have to understand that in this context also, because obviously, I didn't go unisex when I got saved. <laughs> you know, these things continue in our humanity, but we're saying in the spirit. By the spirit, we become one so that we're all equal. Remember, God's not the one who divided this world. It was man who divided man. It's man who looks down and says, this race is inferior to that race. God says, I made one race. I made the human race. And God loves variety. Have you ever seen him stamp out anything you know, use the same pattern, ho-hum, <laughs> you know. 
No, I mean, God gives variety in the dogs. God gives variety in the fishies in the sea. God gives variety in the trees and the land. God, you want to, how can you not believe in a God when you see the genetic gene pool? Right. That alone amazes me. There's no two snowflakes alike, and there's no two human beings alike. And how God can come up with that magnanimous plan that a, a husband and a wife would come together and their offspring would be a reflection out of both of them, but everyone is different. The genetic traits are different, and it goes on, and it goes on, and it goes on. And even those who look identical, you get to know them, and they're not identical on the inside. They may be on the outside to the human eye, but even they can see the difference. Even they know the difference between each other. This also speaks to us of how majestic our God is, how amazing he is, and his plan is mind-boggling and yet is also made simple enough for a child to understand what they need to know and that is that god loved the human race for god so loved the world he didn't make a plan of salvation for the jews and a plan of salvation for the gentiles he didn't put the enmity between them and he didn't separate them and he's not building two houses today he is a, the builder the author the finisher he is over the house and in his house he brings in all who come to love him no matter their shape no matter their size no matter their color and anytime we pick on someone who is different than us you're poking your finger in god's eye because he created and if you say they're inferior you're saying god you created inferior you're saying god created junk you're saying god created something ugly no no it's I don't want to go political here, but it's not just black lives matter, white lives matter, red lives That's matter, right. yellow lives That's matter. Right. We all matter, and we need to come together. We need to have the unity. <laughs> so, said the same thing. Okay. Someone else said the same thing, so where two or three are agreed, let it be established. Okay, I think I've answered it well enough. I hope that, that you're all content with that understanding. I want to move on. Uh, let me give you a rundown because we won't make it through it, so you'll know whether you want to come back <laughs> and where we are headed with this. I was asked for my next question to answer, what are the key players of the tribulation? Who are they? So we will look at, uh, and I'll be giving these, you don't have to hurry and write them down, you'll have time to get the whole list as we go on. If you are in class, I'd be giving you handouts. If you need a handout, all I need is, is an address, even an email, and I can get it to you. So just get a hold of me um, one way or another. But we'll look at the, and we're not looking extensively at every, we're looking at the major role players in the tribulation. So we'll look at the, the 144,000. The good or the bad are all of them, the key players. So we're looking at all of them, the key all players. Them. All yes. of them. So we'll look at the 144,000. That's the good. <laughs> the Antichrist. <laughs> the false prophet, the two witnesses, the woman of chapter 12, and the dragon. Okay, and I think that'll cover all we need. If I think of something I missed, I'll fill it in later. Then we're going to look at, and they go hand in hand with each other, we're going to be looking at the order of the events from the apocalypse, from the tribulation, from Armageddon forward. So just to give you the rundown, because I don't want those who ask the question to have to wait through three, four classes to get it, here's the order of the rundown. You have the Battle of Armageddon bring the tribulation to an end at the second coming of Messiah. So we'll talk about the Battle of Armageddon. Um, let me ask you right now, I will not do this later because we won't get this far, but when I touch on that, how many of you would like me to go into more detail and show you the, the different areas that the Battle of Armageddon has fought, that it's more than just one little, it's not just on the Mount of Olives with his feet cleaving in two. I see one hand, two hands. Okay, I kind of I, okay. I thought you might want that because a lot of people don't understand, it, you know, war is not one episode, one scene. It's like when you're watching a TV program and this happens in this house and you, then you see house and this happens there and something's happening somewhere else and yet it's all at the same time. That's what we need to see and understand. So okay, I will go into that depth then. We'll look at the the battles of Armageddon. I'll put it that way. We'll look at how it ends. 
by the Lord's returning to the areas he returns to in Israel. You can see from my hand I got stopping points. I'll tell you where they are when we get there. That's the second coming of Messiah. We'll talk about that. And then following that comes the saints' resurrection to begin the millennium. I will go into the three phases of the first resurrection. So if you've not heard that or don't understand that, hang tight and I'll cover that at that point because we have that resurrection um, in different phases, but with part of it's right here. Following that is the millennial kingdom, the thousand year reign. At that time, we have Israel regathered. We'll talk about that. At the end of the millennial kingdom, or actually, actually, I'm sorry, at the start of it, we'll have the judgments of Israel, of the nations, of Egypt. We'll see the specific judgments. We'll talk about the marriage supper of the Lamb. A lot of this is simultaneous. We'll, we'll talk about that as we go. We'll talk about how Satan is bound during that thousand years. And the millennial temple, we'll take a good look at it because we see a temple in the tribulation, but that is not the millennial temple, and I stress that. We'll look at earthly Jerusalem in the millennial time, and we'll look at new Jerusalem. Are they one and the same? Are they two different? Are they two different locations? How do we fit this together? Then as our thousand year reign ends, we will look at Gog and Magog. That's the next thing that happens, and I'll explain what that means. Then we will look at the uh, earth being destroyed, the great white throne judgment, and that will take us launched out into the eternal state or eternity future. So I gave you 15 points there that we will look at the order from Armageddon all the way to the eternity future. If you remember my big chart, I'm going to try to find a way to put the chart behind me. Maybe Roger's got a better idea. We'll find some way where if I can, I will show you a point to it because as you see it, I think it helps. If you have the little charts, bring them out to the studies because I think it will help you. At least I'm better if I get it through the eye and the ear. I'm especially better with the eye. Some are better with the ear, but I like to see. <laughs> so, okay, sound good? Everybody in favor? Can you go over it real quickly? Real quickly? Okay, Armageddon, second coming. The saints' resurrection at the beginning of the millennium. So that's your three phases of the first resurrection. The millennial kingdom. At that time, Israel regathered. Judgments on Israel and on the nations, on Egypt in particular. The marriage supper of the Lamb. Satan being bound. Millennial yeah, Temple. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I've got it. They don't have to write oh, it down. Okay. Earthly Jeru Millennial Temple, Earthly Jerusalem, and New Jerusalem. Then we move into Gog and Magog, the earth being destroyed, the Great White Throne Judgment, and the Eternal State or Eternity Future. Some of them wanted it down fast and wanted to have it now. That's why I went back through it. It's a lot, but um, again, I think, you know, here I see. The, our God, a God of order, and it unfolds and it flows, and we'll see that. Um, and if you need one of those charts, I don't know how to get it to you on the computer. We're working on that. We'll see if we can come up with something. Okay? Um, the big chart's so wonderful. I wish we could have a class. Question. question? May, I do have one question. Maybe I should wait till I get in the millennium. But I heard a pastor say the lost can enter the millennium, and I never thought. I know of babies and children can be lost in the millennium, but I thought you had to be saved to enter the we, millennium. We will answer that. The question is, at the start of the millennium, can unsaved go into the millennium, or does it start just with the saved? Because it's going to be a while before I will get there, I don't want to leave you without a good answer. The answer is the millennium starts with believers. Starts with, starts believers. with believers. Now, that now opens the door for you to understand. They don't lose their salvation, but obviously there's a change that comes in. How does that happen? That'll make you wait for my study out of the millennium. If you need it for some reason before then, text me. Okay. So he was wrong, that minister. But well, I, I, was about, I wasn't scripture. buying that too well when he shared that with me. I go, uh, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> if it doesn't sound right, 
your spirit may be judging you, and what you do then is you go to the Word of God to see. Mm -hmm. When we go through those judgments, we will see who goes into the millennium and who does not. We'll look at the Jewish judgments, we'll look at the nation's judgments, that's the Gentiles, we'll look at Egypt in particular as a land. We will see judgments. We will go into Matthew 25. Matthew 25 has parables dealing with it. We'll, we'll cover the whole gamut when we get there. So obviously this is going to be a series of lessons. Um, I'll just leave it there. We'll, we'll, I trust that will be good. And if you miss a lesson, it will go up on YouTube um, or my bit.ly site, bit.ly. If you don't have that site, let me know and I'll get it to you so you can either review or hear it if you miss it. But right now I'd like to go into 144,000 because that's our first topic. So when we look at 144,000, we need to look at Revelation 7. That's the first place that they are mentioned. And we are going to look in detail. So if this seems basic to you, forgive me, but I've got to come um, from a starting point that there are those listening who don't know the background. And so they're, they're asking, needing full understanding. I want to give a full answer. So when we read in Revelation chapter 7, um, the first is telling you that the four angels are, are holding, standing back the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds, so that nothing can be heard on the earth, in the sea, not even a tree, until, and this, this comes now, verse 2. I think, yeah, we want to start with 2. I saw another angel, not the one holding back uh, this evil that's going to come, but I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. He cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, and this is because of what verse 1 said, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bond servants of our God on their foreheads. Okay, what have we learned already in these three verses? We've learned that there are angels that are about to release an evil on this world that will damage the earth, the sea, and the trees. And we know when we read what follows in Revelation, we see all of that in living color. We have learned that there is someone else, another angel, that has a seal from God, from the living God. Remember when we just talked about um, who does Israel worship and or, um, the Jewish people worship? And I'm not sure I followed through to finish that thought. The Jewish people do worship the living God of Israel. And I did mention that I started with, if you come into our Shabbat services, we are worshiping the living God of Israel. The difference for us is we come to the living God of Israel through his son who said, I am the way to the Father, that no man comes to the Father but through me. So we come in, we're on the same page with our Orthodox um, Jewish brethren of worshiping the God of Israel. It's just our way through to make that connection is through the um, son through Yeshua, and it, with, it, that's been brought to us and put into us by the Ruch HaKodesh, the very Holy Spirit of God. So we come at it from the triunity, all taking acts in us, in that point of salvation, where our dear, uh, beloved Jewish brethren who are in Judaism only want to deny the son and do not see the spirit working in that way. Uh, but again, even in their own Shema, the word Echad being the united one shows that God can exemplify himself in more than one. His letter Sheen, it looks like a W, three bars that are equal, tied at one base, show us God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the three in one. There are many ways God has put it out for them to realize and to understand. So when we come together, we can worship together because we're both worshiping the same God. No other religion does. They worship false gods. They worship Allah. They worship Buddha. They worship stones and images and idols. But in this, we agree. That's why, yes, the Jewish people in Judaism worship the living God. It's just to have that relationship. We're told we have to come through the sun, and that's what they do not see and understand, and yet try to earn their, their favor in God's sight. And that's... The sad thing about it, where we know it's not anything we can do, is God who does it all for us. Mm -hmm. It's Yeshua Jesus who did it for us, and we just come in to be made one with him. Then we are joint heirs, as we were saying, where we actually 
we have a future that's out of this world because we're joint heirs with our living Messiah and Savior who is very God himself but exemplifies himself sitting at the right hand of the Father in heaven. So with all that having said, back on track, here we've got these that are not to be harmed until they're sealed from the living God. This seal is going to be on their foreheads. We will see that. I don't think I did read it because I read through verse 3. But let's go back up and look at the fact. In fact, let's look at verse 3 that says they're going to be sealed, the bond of servants of our God. Or yours might just say servant, your, your version. What is a bond servant? A bond servant is a person who's in bondage. It is a slave. It's one that is subservient to entirely at the disposal of his master. He does not get to speak for himself. He does not have freedom. He is the slave to whoever, whomsoever he is in bondage to. In the Roman world, it was uh, a, a pride to be a Roman citizen. You were not subject to anyone. You were free, and you would not consider lowering yourself to the level of being a bond servant. That, that's the exact opposite of being a Roman citizen. But in Yeshua's kingdom, in the world that is to come, his kingdom is not of this world. Let me read that for you. I'm going to have to come back to Revelation, but let me read it for you real quickly. You can just listen if you want. I'm going to John 18 and verse 36, I believe it is. Yes, John 18:36. Yochanan records for us that Yeshua's kingdom is not of this world. Yeshua answered. So it's his actual words. Yochanan John recorded that Yeshua said it. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to, in this case, to the Jews who were there to arrest him. But as it is, and they were mixed, by the way, it was the Roman soldiers that were arresting him. I shouldn't have said that. Let me say for the Jews who were calling for his, um, his being pr taken prisoner and put to death. Okay? Let me put it right. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. My kingdom is not of this earth. His kingdom is a heavenly kingdom, and in his kingdom, the values are completely different. What matters here on earth, it has no consequence in heaven, and what's in heaven is the willingness, the desire to be the bondservant of Yeshua Jesus. He does not force us. He does not tell us, check your brain at the door and now be a doormat. No, he doesn't treat us that way at all. But we love being so completely devoted to him that we want to be his bondservant. We want to sign up for duty each day. We want to say, Lord, what would you have me to do? Lord, how should I handle this situation? What should I do here? We have great examples in scripture that tell us that many were proud to call themselves bondservants of Yeshua Jesus. We have Shaol Paul in Romans 1 verse 1. We have in Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, he says it again. So he says it to the Romans who are really going to say, well, wow, you want to be a bondservant? And to the Philippians who already had a faith in the one true and living God. We have James, the, the um, half-brother of Yeshua Jesus himself, saying he's a bondservant to Messiah or to Christ in James 1.1. 1, 1. Kepha, Peter, says it in 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. And even Yud, or you say Jude, in the very first verse, there's only one chapter, so you can say 1-1 one, one, or you can just say verse 1. He also, they all claim to be bondservants of Yeshua, bondservants of Jesus, bondservants of Christ, the Messiah. And we should want to claim that also. Let me read for you Romans and chapter 6 and verse 22. Romans 6, 22 says... But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification and in the outcome, eternal life. So that's saying when God frees us from sin through the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus, then we get the privilege of being his slaves. We get the benefit that he makes us holy. That's sanctification. He sets us apart. And we're on a holy walk with him now. He works in us. And eventually the outcome is eternal life in heaven with him. 
That's a benefit, that's a plus, that's a glory, hallelujah. So when these 144,000 back in Revelation 7 are sealed with the name of God, they are not, um, it's not forced on them. When we contrast this to the mark of the beast, we're going to see that he forces everyone to take his mark in their forehead or in their right hand. Can't buy or can't sell, can't live life without taking it by that point in the tribulation. But we see here it was a willful, a joyful thing for these to be sealed, to be bond servants of Messiah, of Yeshua Jesus. What's their purpose for being a bond servant for him? What is their intent? Well, let's go to Matthew 24 and verse 14 and let's learn what the purpose of this is. What is the intent here? Matthew 24 and verse 14. We read, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Well, those of us who know that the tribulation brings the end to the world as it is known, that's when the, at the end of it, I've just given you that rundown, will start and set up the millennial kingdom, which is a whole new environment and a whole new world, so to speak. So if this is telling us that the gospel of the kingdom it's going to be preached to the whole world. The good news of the Lord is being preached to the, to the entire world. And then it's the end. We know that that happens in the tribulation period. Well, how does the gospel go out to the whole world in the tribulation period? We have it right here in Revelation 7. These that are his witnesses, we're going to see that they go out into the entire world and take the gospel, the good news, to the ends of the earth. Now, they're Jewish. We're going to look at that. So why are they going to the ends of the earth? You're saying, why don't they just stay in Israel and just, you know, preach it to the Jews in Israel? Well, the Jews in Israel will be preached to also. But is that the only place you find Jewish people? <laughs> and we laugh. Because I don't think you can go to a continent. You can't go to a country. If you are there long enough, you're going to find somebody with Jewish ancestry there. Because we Jews did a great job of being scattered. <laughs> and that was diaspora, and it is still going on to this day. I am a Jew in the diaspora because I am not in my homeland, which is Israel. And there are many Jews everywhere, and God's magnanimous, magnanimous plan takes it from Jewish people who, it, it takes a Jewish one to help a Jewish one usually get it and understand it, and they take it all the way to the ends of the earth. So, we're going to go back and look at who they are then. What, you know, we know that there's 144,000, we know they're sealed by God, we know the purpose is to share the good news that Yeshua Jesus is their Savior, is their Messiah, that he died and raised from the dead and uh, is to, there to give them forgiveness of their sin so that they can be with God forever. But who are they? Well, verse 4 tells us, I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000, from every tribe. If you stopped right there, there could be those that say, oh, from the Indian tribes? We've got Indian tribes around us. But it doesn't give that chance. It spells it out. The tribe of the sons of Israel. Well, the sons of Israel, the sons of Jacob, Yaakov, who was renamed Israel, are the list that we have here in verses 5 through, we go through verse 8. Yudah, Reuben, um, I'll, give you your, I'll give you their names in the Hebrew. Yehuda, Reuben. God, and that's not this God, but that's how you pronounce Gad. Uh, Asher, Naphtali, Manashe, Shimon, Levi, or Levi, Yisachar, Zebulon, Yosef, and Benjamin. Now, I know you can get them in your English, so I won't go through them in the English, but it is spelled out specifically. We have 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes. Now, if God took all the trouble of these verses, spelling it out this specifically, I'm going to take him at face value, and I'm going to tell you that there are 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes, that that's the qualification genetically, ethnically, they have to be from those 12 tribes, and they are the evangelists who will carry out the message. Now, if you read through that list and you went back into Genesis 49, where Yaakov's 12 sons are named, we have a problem because somebody's missing. 
No, Gad is there. He's there. Who is missing? No, Joseph's there. He's right just before the end. Joseph and Benjamin. I'll give it to you. Dan. Yeah, that's right. Dan is the one who is missing. Okay? I think that were the worst words there's, <laughs> there's a reason for that. We'll go into that reason, but here is the grace of our God. In the restored kingdom, when the 12 tribes are named, Dan is back. So he's not a participant in the 144,000, but just as God never does away with the Jew, never says, I'm done with them, I'm giving all their promises to the church, here we see living proof again that Daniel, Dan, I'm sorry, it's not Daniel. I'm so used to teaching yeah. Daniel. <laughs> Dan, that, or Dawn is actually the right way to say it, but I don't want you to think D-O-N, so I'm saying it in English, yeah. that Dan is forgiven. But because of his sin in particular is why we believe he's not mentioned here. So what would disqualify him from being part of the 144,000 preaching the gospel is the exact opposite. Dan went into idolatry first, and Dan led his brethren into idolatry. They worshiped false gods, and when we look, and I believe we're going to do it later, so I won't do it now, but when you look at the prophecy in, in Genesis 49, that what was spoken prophetically over the sons, you will see that, that Dan is not put in a good light there, that he falls backward and he causes others to fall backward with him. If someone has gone into false worship, that would be reason why they would not be used by God to bring the truth. But yet, God is a forgiving God, and they can be brought back into right fellowship, and that's why we do see them with a portion of the temple area given to their tribe in Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48, the millennial time, the millennial kingdom. So God is not done with them. But I found it very interesting. It's Ezekiel, Ezekiel, yes. yes, chapters 40 through 48 give the Millennial Temple. We'll, we'll do that again when we get there. We'll look at a lot of that. I, w I had the great privilege and honor of being in Israel this past year, 2019. There's an area that is the area of Dan that was excavated more than the last time I had been there. And they showed in this area, a very small area that we went through, you could still see the ruins of altars that were to the false gods and even one of the altars that was where they would sacrifice babies to a false god. That's called Moloch, M-O-L-E-C-H in scripture. It's in our history. It's one of the saddest notes of our history. It grieves my heart horribly to even teach it. But if they did fall that far off into sin that they could make human sacrifice to a false idol, it is no wonder God does not allow them the handling of his word of God to bring the good news to the world. So again, not that God wipes out those people. He's not punishing people born in, in 2000 for what happened in, in thousands BC, but we do see the consequences of his tribe they missed out on a blessing. And that's what we see when we do sin. We're still his children, but we may miss out on a blessing. How many of you were raised that way in your life where you blew it with your parents, you did something wrong, and the consequence was you missed out on a treat. You didn't get to do something or you weren't given something. Your parents still loved you. In fact, that was why they did it was to teach you right from wrong but you're still theirs. And so even though it's, there's a heaviness in my heart here, when I saw those altars that, that, you know, we're going back, oh my goodness, I'm going to say at least 3000 BC. And when we can go back that far and still see monuments that were there for idolatry, wow, that, that's heavy. That's very heavy. By the way, if you want them being restored in the kingdom, you want the shortcut, go to chapter 48, verses 1 and 32 in chapter 48. Because he's there. In fact, you know what? Because we're not in a hurry, let's go look at that. Because I don't want to leave them on such a, a, a horrible note. <laughs> um, let's go to Ezekiel. And I'm actually going there because I want to back you up to another chapter there also. So I'll just have you there ahead of time. <laughs> 
Chapter 48 and verse 1 says, Now these are the names of the tribes from the northern extremity, beside the way of Hethlon or Hamad, it depends on where you're reading it, in my Hebrew, Hazat, Anon, the border to Demesek. These are hard words even in uh, Hebrew. But my point being, in verse 1 we have, um, and I lost it because I went from the English, there we go, I went from English to my Jewish. Let me stick with the English for a moment. When we start in the middle from the border of Damascus, we get past some hard names. Toward the north, beside Hamath, running from east to west, down one portion. Okay, thank you. I've got my split here, but oh. that might help, so, so thank you. We'll get rid of the maps there. No, there we go. Whoops. Okay, I just closed it out, Roger. That's okay. I've got it here, but thank you. Okay, what did we read right here? That the one in the north is down. That was... Um, Dan's territory. They were the furthest northern country. So we see Dan mentioned in, in chapter 48, verse 1. In fact, in my complete Jewish Bible, it starts with it. Before it gives our names, it just says, this is Dan's territory from the north end through, and then it gives the description. Now go down to verse 32. And in verse 32, we have all the tribes being named, by the way, in these verses in between. In verse 32, from 30 on, we're talking about the city gates, and we have in verse 32, the east side has a gate that's 4,500 cubits, three gates, it has the gate of Yosef, the gate of ben and the gate of Dan. So Dan is there also. Rowena got in just in time. She saw Dan with me, and we're talking about the idolatry we saw from the tribe of Dan, remember of northern Israel? I'm sure that you remember. I'm just pulling her in here so she can get into context with us, and it's timely because she's my witness to what I saw. Okay, so we see here's the description of how the area is laid out, which tribe gets which territory, and we see Dan is right there. We even see a city gate for Dan. City gates are where the business is done. It's not just a, a gate that opens and closes like out in your front yard. This is an area where they come in, and if I could show you pictures, I could show you the area where I saw the, the um, altars to the, the false gods. I could show you the areas where you get the idea of how they sat in the city gates and did business. There was more than enough room to sit. We sat and we took pictures. So I wish I could show you. That's the downside of Zoom. But when we're back together, maybe sometime we can show you that. Because it makes it real. It makes us know that the scripture is accurate and alive and uh, that we're, in, we're getting truth here. Go back to chapter 39 in Ezekiel with me. I told you that the millennial kingdom starts with, or the millennial temple, I'm sorry, starts with chapter 40. Well, let's look at the setup to chapter 40. We're looking at the last verses of chapter 39. If you've been with me before, you know when I taught on Hezekiel, I talk about how he is a book that, that brings order. It lists things in order. In chapter 37, you have Israel back in the land that is dry bones because there's no spirit in them. That's where we are today. Chapters 38 and 39 deal with the Battle of Armageddon. When we talk about the Battle of Armageddon, I guarantee you we'll be in those references along with Daniel 11 and others that talk about the same time. At the end of uh, 39 now, at the end of the Battle of Armageddon, then when we turn into chapter 40 and move forward, that's where we get the Millennial Kingdom. That kingdom is far different than the one that we see in Revelation during the Tribulation period. Okay? Let's read the end of verse 39. We'll start with, I mean chapter 39. We'll start with verse 25. Therefore, Adonai Elohim, the Lord God says this, now, now that the battle's over, now I will restore the, the fortunes of Yaakov, of Jacob, and have compassion on the entire house of Israel. I will be jealous for my holy name. Remember, he put his name on Israel. They will bear their shame and all their, their guilt for breaking faith with me once they are living securely in their land with no one to make them afraid. What he's saying is they broke, they didn't keep with me, They've suffered those consequences. They've, they, they've been shamed. They were cast out of the land. But now when I bring them back into the land, they're going to live securely in the land. And no one will make them afraid. Now, anyone want to say that's true for Israel today? Good. You have the right answer. If you read one newspaper 
that tells you world news. You will read uh, the trouble on Israel's borders. You will read how right now this week, Lebanon is a hot border, Egypt is a hot border, and Gaza in her side like a thorn in her flesh is hot. All of them wanting to come against Israel. She's not living without being afraid. She's got 22 Arab countries around her that would love to push her into the sea, and she knows it. To lose a battle would be to lose her life. She knows it. So this has to be future. This, verse 27, this will be after I have brought them back from the peoples and gathered them out of their enemies' lands, thereby being consecrated through them in the sight of many nations. What's he saying? God is saying, or, or the Lord speaking, he is saying, I'm going to gather my Jewish people from all over the world, from those nations that they are have been scattered in, the enemies of their lands. There are Jews in Iraq. There are Jews in Syria. There are Jews in places that, that they're hiding their Jewishness or they'd be dead. They're all going to be brought back and they're going to be consecrated. They're going to be set apart into our holy God in the sight of all the nations of the world. Remember last the last few weeks we talked about the times of the Gentiles. The rule is going to end with that image that Nebuchadnezzar saw, the head, the, the shoulders, all the way down to the, the revived Roman Empire with the ten toes, that all of that is crushed by the stone that's representing Messiah, and then his kingdom takes over the face of the earth. That's the millennium when Israel will be the head nation, and that's this verse right here when she'll be consecrated in the sight of the nations of the world. Verse 28, then they will know I am Adonai their God, since it was I who caused them to go into exile among the nations, we talked about that. We said they've gone into captivity because of idolatry, because they forgot their God. But he not only has exiled them, it is, it is, it, 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 and it was I who regathered them to their own land. I will leave none of them there anymore. At this point, every Jew is going to be in the land of Israel. That's unheard of at this point today, but that's what our God will do. And I will no longer hide my face from them, for I have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, says Adonai Elohim. There can be more beautiful words. When the spirit of God is poured out, that's Zechariah 12.10, read it on your own, but that's it in its fulfillment. They will look up, they will see their Messiah, they'll realize this is the one that they had missed, but now they have faith in him, and they say, Baruch HaBab Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He will come put his feet down in, in Israel, stop that battle, and gather from the four corners of the earth the Jewish people to come and live in the land that God had ordained for them. That's a big hallelujah. That's what's going to take place. And once that's established, and we go into the millennial kingdom, where God says all the rest of the world gets to come up, be blessed, take the blessings back to their nations. God never said, I don't care about the Gentiles. He just simply has an order to bless the world. Okay, so Dan is missing now, but he comes back. Who takes his place now? Because well, I read you 12 names. I gave you 12 tribes. So let's go back to Revelation chapter 7, and let's look for the additional name. If you're hunting and you're looking through the list, I'll give you a hint. Go halfway and stop. Because in verse 6, we have from the tribe of Manasseh. You say Manasseh. Now, who was Manasseh? Was he one of Jacob's 12 sons? When Leah and Rachel and Zilpha and Bilhah gave birth to 12 sons, was he one of those 12? Joseph. Very good. Joseph. Joseph. He was a grandson of Yaakov. So God took the grandson and brought him in as a substitute, and out of his progeny, he's got a whole tribe also, and God's bringing 12,000 out of that tribe who will preach the gospel during the tribulation period. What an honor for Manashe, and I believe it's because God must have seen in him a heart to follow the one true and the living God. And it's interesting because if you go into his history, Yosef married into um, other tribe, into Egyptian because he was in Egypt. But here is God bringing in the purity line, keeping it there, and fulfilling his word. So here he's listed 
when you look at the Millennial Temple and you, the division of the land, Manashe Manasseh is not listed. So he fills in in um, the tribulation period, and then he still gets great blessings. He's still Jewish, and he's still in the land. So now we know who they are. We know their purpose is gospel message to the ends of the earth. Does anybody get saved? Do they get the word up? Does anybody get saved? Well, let's keep reading. Let's read um, verses 9 on. We'll stop at a certain point. After these things, after what we just talked about, Yochanan John is speaking. I looked and behold, hello, wake up, don't miss it, a great multitude, a huge crowd, which no one could count from every nation, every tribe, or all tribes, depending on your version, and peoples, and tongues, and they're standing before the throne, before the Lamb, they're clothed in white robes, they have palm branches in their hands, and they're shouting, and what are they shouting? Salvation to our God, Hoshana, salvation to our God, victory to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. I think I'll stop right there for a moment. We will go on and read some more verses, but we need to notice who, okay? We have a multitude that comes from every nation, all the tribes, from all the peoples, all the tongues. What we're seeing here is that they all get fruit. Remember, they all went out, they went to the ends of the earth and threw out their ministry all the way to the ends of the earth. There were those who got saved. There were those who came to believe. They, are, they speak different languages. They look different. They're colored different. But they all came into saving faith. And that brought them into this place where we see them standing before the throne. What throne? God's throne. Before the Lamb. The Lamb of God. Remember in Revelation we see him at the right hand of the Father. I call the love seat built for two. And uh, it's our, our God the Father and our God the Son. Notice something about them. They're clothed in white robes. How do we get white robes? Any of us who are in the presence of God, we know that's the robe of righteousness that the Lord gives us. When we come into saving faith with Him, He puts His righteousness on us. Our works, filthy rags. His work, righteous. White shows a purity and a holiness, so we know that they are in faith in Messiah didn't matter that they had different tongues. didn't matter they lived in different nations. didn't matter they came from different tribes. The one uh, common ingredient, if I can use the word ingredient, is that they have saving faith in Yeshua Jesus. So they have the white robes, and they see him as their Savior. So the same way when he came the first time, lowly and riding on the donkey, but it was declared that the Messiah would come that way. Zechariah, Zechariah 9.9, we looked at that, we saw the fulfillment in Luke last time when we were talking, that they cried out, they put palm branches down in front of the donkey, and they cried out, Hoshana, salvation to our God. That's what we're seeing here, they're doing the same thing, they are worshiping, they are honoring God, they are honoring the Lord, and they, they're crying out with that loud voice, claiming he's the one who saved us. It's God who sits on the throne, and it's his lamb, because the lamb is the one who gave his life um, for, for the salvation of their souls. So we now know that, yes, people get saved. Hallelujah. Their work is not void. It's not defeated. Their work goes forth, and people are saved. Yes? Just before you go to the next person, that would be... Oh, oh I'm not quite done. Okay, so just from what you said about the tribes... Uh -huh. I'm hearing, or I think I'm hearing, like, there's three tribes here. I mean, same? Twelve tribes, right. just different personalities in it. So one had Joseph in it. Mm -hmm. Joseph's one of the original twelve tribes in the Old Testament. But when we, then we were moving towards the uh, book of Revelation, where in Revelation 4, he's still in it. But did, did it change? To, when did it change to Manasseh? When the 144,000 are sealed. Those from the tribe of Dan are not sealed. They're not a part of it. That's where God substitutes with Manasseh to fulfill the fact that there's 12 tribes, 12,000 from each. He, he so originally Dan was there. Originally right? Dan was there. Genesis 49, we see that Dan's one of the sons. 
but he's not allowed to be part of the 144,000. It's, it's the same way that you give a kid time out, okay? Right. Here's a great example. When I taught day camp, we took the children to swimming lessons, we took them to tennis lessons, we took them on field trips, we had all kinds of activities going on. In a day, we would do several of those. We'd have tennis lessons for two hours, and then we'd have lunch, and then we'd have another activity for two hours through the course of the day. If the children were acting up, a child in particular, and let's say this child just really would not correct, we would finally threaten them, you will miss out on the next activity. You will be sat down while they do tennis, or while they swim, or while they go into the, this place that was fun, if you don't correct. And it happened, I'm sorry to say. Kids are kids, whether they're born in 2000 or whether they were born in 2000 BC. And we would sometimes have to set a child down and they'd miss out on that next activity. But then when we went to the next activity, they were allowed back in again. Okay, so that's when we started with Joseph and then at the ceiling of the 144,000, we're now adding Manasseh to this at the millennial, because we're talking about great tribulation. This is tribulation. This is tribulation. So we got Manasseh, Joseph yes. is out. No, Joseph's in. Dan's out. Oh, Dan's out. Yeah, okay, Joseph so. is in. Joseph and his son. Right, so sure. in the millennial kingdom, Dan is in. Back right. in. Right. And Manasseh is we, he he's just, not mentioned. Because, right, he's not mentioned because his portion is with his grandfather Joseph. Okay, so we've got three lists here. Yes. Old Testament, yes. Great Tribulation, yes. and then New England. Yes. Kingdom. If you're not here in our loo, she's questioning, do we have three lists? Yes, we do. In Genesis 49, Original Covenant, we have the 12 listed, and Dan is in there. In the Tribulation, we have the 144,000 from 12 tribes. Dan is missing. And the, the grandson of Joseph, Manasseh, Manasseh, is brought in in his place. Then when we get to the list of the 12 tribes in the Millennial Kingdom, we have Dan brought back in. Remember, he just missed out on one activity. We have Dan brought back in, and Manasseh would just be, Manasseh, he'll just be part of the area that Joseph is given, his father. His grandfather, sorry, his grandfather. No, his father. Father. <laughs> yeah. father. Grandfather is Jacob. Okay? So so we do have three different lists. The first and the third list match. The one in the middle has the, the one difference, Dan out, Menasha in, and then we go back to the original. Okay, Rowena, can you unmute yourself? I see your hand. Okay. Um, my question is, um, do, this, do these people know that they belong to these tribes, or this is just a knowledge given to us because God knows them? Very no. good question. Uh, Very good question. I even thought at one point to go into this, and I got sidetracked. Do they know? No, they do not know. Right now, today, if your name is Levi or Cohen, you know you're from the tribe of Levi. Because Cohen means priest, Levi is a pr the priestly tribe. So you can be pretty secure that unless something really went awry, somehow, you know, some, some fluke, if that's your name, you're of the priestly tribe, you come from the line of Levi. But we don't know who's a part of, of Gad today, or who's a part of Dan, or who's a part of, of um, Yosef. We, 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 none of us can know for sure. There are individuals who want to say it's been passed down through their family, but they still don't have papers of authentication. By 70 AD, when the temple was destroyed, the records were destroyed. No one can prove what tribe they're from in a way that would stand up in court from 70 AD forward. By the way, side note that critically important. If Messiah is to prove who he came from, and he had to come from the right tribe to be Messiah, he had to be of the house of David, he had to come from Judah. If the Messiah is to prove that, then he had to come before 70 AD, because there is no way to prove it since. I believe fully that God closed that door because it had been fulfilled before 70 AD by the one called Yeshua Jesus, of the tribe of Judah, of the house of David, exactly like all the genealogical prophecies said, 
but no one today could prove that. They had to be by 70 AD. So, how do we get this here in the book of Revelation? We get it by faith. God says it, and I believe it. And we have to accept it that way, but here's a very interesting note. DNA today has found the marker for the Levites, for the, the priestly tribe. So that some who don't even know that that should be their last name because somewhere along the line it got changed are finding out that they belong to that tribe. Now, will God allow DNA to be able to discover traits that fit just each of the tribes and bring that out? I don't know. But I do know it's God who seals and God knows. So God has preserved each tribe which amazes me, with all the intermarriage you think of today, God has kept enough purity of the tribes that he can pull out 12,000 out of each tribe, and he knows who they belong to. So whether we get to, well, it's not us because we won't be around to see it, but whether the people at that time are able to know or not, I, I don't know. I can't answer that. There's a, a chance that DNA might develop to that degree because they have begun, but but I don't know. Rhonda, yes. I think you've got to unmute. Rhonda's in the middle second row. Roger's hurrying, but you might have to unmute yourself also, Rhonda. Okay. okay. Um, I'm confused. Uh -oh. But you know who you are, so I don't understand how you, if you know who you are, how come you're saying they don't know who they are? I know I'm Jewish. I don't know what tribe I came from. I just know I'm Jewish. All the 12 sons are considered Jewish. The name Jew actually came from the tribe of Judah. It, it's actually you or Yehudi, if you give the, the plural. That came from Judah. When um, the ten northern tribes have gone into captivity, you're left with just Judah and Benjamin, the southern tribes, who stayed for a while longer faithful to God, and then they went into idolatry, so they also go into captivity. Judah was the predominant. Benjamin was smaller. Benjamin was little brother. So when Judah went into captivity, and notice how I'm referring to it, it's actually Judah and Benjamin. But Judah, because he was predominant, was his name that was carried. When those two went into captivity, their people, whether they were from Benjamin or whether they were from Judah, were called Jews. Now, Babylon swallowed them up when they were finally, you know, they got it and had said, okay, you know, I have to let you go into exile because you brought it on yourself. Then Babylon swallowed them up. Interestingly enough, Babylon had swallowed up Assyria. Now, do you remember where the ten northern tribes went? They went into Assyria. So if Assyria has now been swallowed up by Babylon, the ten northern tribes are now swallowed up by Babylon, the two southern tribes are now swallowed up by Babylon, you got 12 tribes, all in captivity and mingling and co-mingling. So by the time they come out, they're all called Jews. And the name carries on through today. So Abraham was not a Jew. Isaac was not a Jew. Jacob really wasn't even a Jew. You have Abraham, Abraham we called a Hebrew, which meant he crossed over from mm -hmm. idolatry to the one true living God. You have his son Yitzhak called an Israelite. He was a... He, he was an Israelite. I can't say uh, because it wasn't. Then you have Yaakov, Jacob, whose God changes his name when he strives with him. He changes his name to Israel. And then we have the common, the common title, the 12 tribes of Israel. You could say the 12 tribes of Jacob, but Jacob was more his fleshly name and Israel was more his spiritual name. So we go with, with Israel. We call it that. And we have them carry down the name Israelites also. Remember, God said he was a God of Israel all the way back, and that's where Israelite came from, was being the God of Israel. If you were the God of Israel, you were an Israelite. That's, that's how that name got to be. So first it's Hebrew, then it's Israelite, and then it's finally Jew that's carried on from Judah in history. Now, Paul said, I'm all things, I'm, I'm a Jew, I'm a Hebrew, I'm an Israelite. I can say that today also. I've crossed over out of, well, I wasn't personally in, I, well, I guess I was, because I wasn't saved, but I had the privilege of crossing over when I was very little. <laughs> um, but I'm a crossover. I don't worship idolatry. I worship the one true and living God, so I'm a Hebrew. 
I know that I am of Israel, I'm the God of Israel, and I know I am Jewish. That's been passed down to me, that's my heritage and I know it. And if you DNA test me, I do come up Jewish. Um, I have more in me than just Jewish, but I tell people I'm fully Jewish because that's my heart. <laughs> but um, my dad coined the beloved word, Jew-tile. That's part <laughs> Jewish, part Gentile. And technically that's what I am. My dad was full Jewish, but my mom had Gentile in her blood, so I'm a mix also. But anyway, my point being, I, that's all I can claim. Am I of, of Dan? I hope not. <laughs> Sorry, Dan. <laughs> I'd rather be of Judah like my Messiah is. Uh, my dad being living out Boaz for my mom's root. Boaz was of the tribe of Judah. So we like to say we're of the tribe of Judah, but we cannot prove that. And really it doesn't matter. What matters to me is that I am Jewish, and I declare my Jewishness. I'm not ashamed of it, and I declare it. So I know I'm Jewish. But I have no idea, when you get way back in my history, what ancestry would take me to which tribe. By the way, DNA, I love it. You give science, you give DNA, you give whatever, enough time, and they prove the Bible every time. Do you know DNA says for the Jewish race that they can take us back to four mamas? When I heard that, I had the biggest Cheshire grin on my face. You know who the four mamas are? Leah, Rachel, Zilpha, and Bilhah. They got it right. Out of these four gals came the 12 sons who make up the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, they don't tell you it's those four mamas, but they trace it to four lines that give them, if you're Jewish, you come from one of these four lines. Fascinating. I, like I say, Cheshire Cat, I'm giggling because you're just proving my word of God true. But can they tell me which out of those four? Not yet. If they do find a way to break that down, maybe they will begin to find tribal um, um, traits. traits. Thank you. Maybe that is how they'll, they'll begin to. But again, whether God reveals that and allows them to know it, God knows it. He keeps the records. He knows that was a good question. I like getting into that because I get to when, when they're proving the word of God. It just <laughs> okay. So back on tra oh my word. Okay, this is going to be a series of classes for sure because we're not getting anywhere near as far as I thought we would today. I hope you don't mind. I hope it's a blessing in detail. But let's get back to chapter seven in Revelation. Let's go just a little further. I think I read through verse. Yeah, read to verse 11. I read to verse 10, up to verse 11. Okay. Um, I'm still in Revelation, Revelation 7. So we're still talking about 144,000. We now know that the purpose was to take the salvation message to the world, and we know that people throughout the world got saved. Okay? But let me show you what happens to those who got saved. Yeah, we did go through. We're, verse 13, we, we described that. But these that we're describing in verse 13, they're standing before the throne, okay? What are they saying as they're standing before the throne? They're worshiping God. And then how are they described? The white robes, we talked about that. But then here's where we left off. Where have they come from? Okay? Said to him, um, the angel asked Yochanan. He's seen this vision, and he asked Yochanan, where did they come from? And Yochanan says, my Lord, now that's just respect. Sir, you know. And so the angel said to Yochanan, to John, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. And they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now we know the great tribulation is the last three and a half years. So the whole tribulation is seven years. But when the word great is put in there, we know it's the last three and a half years. So this group in particular, seen here in chapter 7, are saved throughout the nations but they're saved out of that last three and a half years. Do I want to say it yet or do I want to keep reading my next thought? Um, okay, I think in verse 15 we read that uh, they serve him day and night in the temple and the tabernacle, okay? Let me pick up with verse 16, describing them still. They will hunger no longer, thirst no more, the sun won't be down on them, nor any heat scorch them, in other words, for the Lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd and will guide them to springs of the water of life. 
and God will wipe it to every tear from their eyes. They're in heaven now. They can't hunger anymore. They can't thirst anymore. The sun's not going to scorch them anymore. The suffering for them is over. We know that that's descriptive to what happens during the last three and a half years. At the three and a half year point, you have the Antichrist take over um, in such a way of authority. This is when he puts the image in the temple and says, you will worship me. I am God. If you don't worship me, off with your head, literally. Beheading will be the mode of capital punishment in the tribulation. If you don't have his mark, you can't go buy and sell. If you can't go buy and sell, you can't go to the grocery store. You can't get money to purchase food. You're going to go hungry. You can't buy water. You're going to be thirsty. You're going to be suffering the consequences. Then you add in the, the tribulation seals and uh, trumpets and all, and you have the scorching of the sun. You have all of this happening. So these are people during that time who will suffer and to the point of probably loss of life because of where we're seeing them and when we're seeing them, but they will be in heaven forever. They are, you know, they lose their earthly life, but they gain their eternal soul. Now, because it stresses this is the last three and a half years, notice what idea we are given in that first three and a half years. We know that initially the Antichrist comes on the scene, but he disguises his real intents. I brought that out before. He's going to let the Jews build the temple, but he's thinking to himself, it's going to be for me. It's not going to be as they think. During the first three and a half years, the Antichrist is still a dictator, but he's benevolent in some of his ways. He is going to tolerate Judaism. Build your temple, or you know, if it's built before, then continue do your services until he comes to that point at that midpoint when he wants all the worship himself. He will work hand in hand with the one called the harlot in Revelation 17, which is another false religion. He's going to work with her, gain her trust. She works with him. In fact, it says that the harlot rides the beast, but we're going to see there comes a point in time when he's done with her. Thank you very much. I'm done with all I can gain, all the riches I can extract from your religion. And we'll talk about this when we get into Revelation 17 in the future in some of our topics. But that's when he'll cut off their way of worship and he wants all the worship himself. But this first three and a half years, he's more, quote, tolerant. That allows those 144,000 to carry out that message, get it out to the ends of the earth where we see people saved. So it, it uh, really is almost a free a time to preach freely, like we in America are experiencing right now. We can preach and not worry about it, it costing us our lives, but we know there's places in this world that they are not free, and by preaching, they do lose their lives. That's a small sample of what will happen from the, the midpoint forward in um, the tribulation period. So we see now when they are, who they are, who they preach to, we see that the, the they have results. The last thing that we want to look at is Revelation 14. This is where they're named again. Revelation 14. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 5. Okay, and it doesn't go through listing all the tribes, but we're talking about the 144,000 still. Verse 1 says, I, being John, Yochanan, I looked, and behold, hello, pay attention, it's important again, the Lamb, and we know who the Lamb was, Yeshua, the, the perfect Lamb of God, was standing on Mount Zion. Now, where's Mount Zion? Is it in heaven? Is it in Utah? <laughs> Sorry, but I have to say that. It's in Israel. Okay, so we have an earthly scene. We have an Israeli earthly scene. The Lamb is, has come out of heaven standing on Mount Zion. And with him are 144,000. Well, that fits because 144,000 have been on the earth doing their job witnessing. They've not been up in heaven. They've been sealed, remember, so that they could not be hurt. Their assignment to be carried out. So we have here, as we go on and we look at this, and by the way, here's the declaration, so you know I'm talking about the same 144,000. They have his name and the name of his father written on their foreheads. Remember, they were sealed with the name of the living God on their foreheads. So we know it's the same as chapter 7, the same group. 
Now, verse 4 gives us a hint. If we drop down there, these are the ones. Uh, maybe I don't. Let me go to the middle of it. You know what? Let me wait because I'm going to confuse you. What I'm, I'll just tell you what I want to say because we're going to read through verse 4. But what I want to say is they may be considered the first fruits of the millennial kingdom. First fruits is the first brought to the Lord. We don't have a record of their death. Now, there's a hint that it could be that there's a point where their job is done and then they do, their life is taken from them. It's not clear either way, so whichever side you want to be on with that is fine. But I kind of tend to think that these 144,000 were sealed permanently. I think they're going to go all the way through the tribulation without losing their lives. And I think that they're going to enter into the Millennial Kingdom again. In answer to your question, these are safe people who will go into the Millennial Kingdom that the Lord is setting up. But even if they lost their lives, we will see them with a role in the Millennial Kingdom. But uh, let's go back in order so I don't confuse you. We, we read through verse 1, verse 2. I heard a voice from heaven that again proves this is an earthly scene. Yochanan is being given a vision. It's not happening yet. The cell has it, but he's seeing it as if it really is happening. Remember, he was caught up, so he's caught up and he's seeing from heaven. But he's seeing an earthly scene and he's hearing a voice out of heaven. So we know very assuredly this is an earthly scene. There is no doubt about that at all. Um, the sound of the Father's voice is the sound of many waters, the sound of, of loud thunder. That's, that's the booming voice of our God. If you've ever heard, go to Disneyland, and the booming voice that comes out, you know, boys and girls, men and women, and it booms. That's nothing compared to the booming voice of our God that will be heard throughout his entire world at this point. It's like the sound of rushing waters. You go to Niagara Falls, and the sound is deafening, I'm told, that it's so loud. Well, our God is that loud. It is heard like a voice, like a loud thunder, voice that's heard, and the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing their harps. Now, keep that in mind. In fact, you know what? Take a side trip real quick with me just to the next chapter, 15 and verse 2. And we see there something like a sea of glass mixed with fire. Those who have been victorious over the beast, the, the, the beast hasn't won, they won, and his image and the number of his name they're standing on the sea glass. They're holding the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the bond servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. What are they singing? Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all the nations will come to worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. These are safe people that are worshiping God in um, the future what we're seeing in the millennial time because we have the, the Lord on the Mount of Olives. We know that he has come down. He has set up his kingdom. But notice that they are holding harps and singing. And go, now go back to verse, chapter 14. And we have here that they have a voice of the sound of harpists playing on their harps. So chapter 15 is probably describing the same people. There's probably others there also, but it's probably a description of, um, of our um, 144,000 in chapter 14, who are the 144,000 of chapter 7. Notice in verse 3, when they sing a new song before the throne, we have the song that we saw just now in chapter 15, the song of Moses, Moshe. Well, what's Moshe's song? That was Jehovah's victory over Israel's foes. When they came through the Red Sea, the Egyptian army had drowned. They're singing the song of Moshe. Who's singing that? Israel. Children of Israel. Okay. Then there's the song of the Lamb. The song of the Lamb is the song of redemption. The only ones who can sing that are the ones who have been redeemed. Are Jewish people redeemed? Yes, when they believe in the Lamb, they are. So I believe that calling in a new song Connecting with chapter 15, the song of Moshe, the song of the Lamb, I believe that we are again seeing a group of Jewish believers worshiping God. That fits with a name from the 12 tribes. 
So here again, I think it's just making it distinctly all the, the clear. And by the way, redeem means purchased by God for himself. We know that's true for Jew or Gentile, but here these were the Jewish ones that he saved for himself. What else do we learn about them? We learn, I think we want to go to verse 4. Yes. Verse 4, these are the ones who have not been defiled with women. Okay? Um, you may have a virgin, ver, virgin, V-E-R-S-I-O-N, that says virgin, V-O-R-G-I-N. They're virgin. Okay? Virgin. In fact, um, my other one here says, these are the ones who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins, and then it goes on. This other one says, for they have kept themselves chests. Okay, here's your argument. There are those who jump on this and say, okay, then the 144,000 are men only, and they're unmarried single men. Now, is that what the scripture's saying? Yeah, I was going to ask, is that literal? Is it literal or not? Good question. I believe that this is spiritual. It is not talking about the physical for this very reason. A married man is not defiled. When he has intercourse with his wife, he is considered clean. It's outside of the marriage that defilement comes in. So I believe that the point of this is showing that spiritually they are one with God only. They didn't go out to another God. They didn't fall, go into false worship at any time. They have stayed pure and holy with their God. So I don't believe it has to be men only. We think in that way, but it can be men or women, I believe, in the tribe. Now, can I prove that and say it has to be? No, I can't be dogmatic, but I can tell you that, that there are women of each of those tribes also. So let me give you some scripture to back this up now. Let me show you that marriage does not defile. And I think that's critical to hear in this day and age today. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 13. And we will look at Hebrews 13 and we're going to look at verse 4. Hebrews 13 and verse 4 says, Marriage is to be held in honor among all. Or my other version says marriage is honorable in every respect. And the marriage bed is to be undefiled. How can you defile the marriage bed? by going and having relations with someone else. Fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. So here it makes it very clear, marriage is honorable, marriage is not a defilement. If you are in a monogamous relationship, you are considered pure. You're considered a chaste virgin. Now, we're going to see even more than, than that coming up in just a moment in the spiritual sense, but let me remind you, the world religion of the tribulation time is called a whore or a harlot. What is a whore or a harlot? One who's having sexual relationships with many. Now, when it's talking about the whore or the harlot of Revelation 17, are we talking about one woman with a number of men, or are we talking about a religious system that is outside of God and is making connections with all the others? Well, let's look at... Good answer. But let's go ahead and look at Revelation 17 real quickly and get our answer from Scripture. Some of us know, but let's see it and be able to back it up from Scripture. Revelation 17, 1. Um, jumps in in the middle. Come here. I will show you the judgment of the great harlot, the whore, who sits on many waters. Verse 2. With whom the kings, plural, of the earth have committed acts of immorality. Okay, how have kings of the earth committed immorality with this harlot who's sitting on many waters? <coughs> Obviously, we have uh, imagery here. We have metaphors. We don't have a single woman who is having relations with the literal kings of the earth, and they all fornicated together. But we do have one who is a world religion bringing all world religions in together, mixing it all into one cup, and calling it holy, calling it pure, and it's anything but, because God says, I am the only God. You'll have no other gods before me. He is a jealous God. He does not share his place with any, and no nothing deserves that. So, spiritual adultery in the original covenant, the Old Testament, 
we see was idolatry. We, we see every time that they worship idols, it would be given in that that they were being spiritually adulterers. In the New Covenant, we talk about friendship with the world that's rejecting Messiah as spiritual adultery. Now, take this into the tribulation time, and those who refuse to worship the image of the beast, they're separating themselves from the world of idolatry. They're staying true, pure virgins to the one true and holy God. Do we see virgin used in that way in our time, the New Covenant time? Yes, we do. 2 Corinthians 11.2. Remember, Scripture interprets Scripture. That way we don't get man's idea. We get what God is, is wanting us to know and understand. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. We have Shaul Paul speaking. He's speaking to the, the church, the called out assembly, the group in Corinth who have come to believe in Yeshua, but they're not living a life of holiness. He's calling them out on everything, even to the point that they had sons having relations with the mothers. It was pretty bad. But Shaul Paul says in verse 2, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I betrothed you to one husband so that to Christ or to Messiah, I might present you as a pure virgin. What's Shaul Paul saying? You have come to believe. You, I was presenting you to God as a pure virgin. Well, obviously, he's not talking about, I've picked just the men out, and men who've never had a relationship with a woman. Obviously, this is, uh, is spiritual talk. It's metaphor. It's, there's another word or not. Um, it escapes me, but you know what I'm saying. It's being used in a spiritual sense, that we who are that body of Messiah today are considered a virgin being presented to the Father by the Son. We are the bride of Christ, the bride of Messiah. Now that doesn't mean that, that we have to all be one sex and never been married. No, it doesn't fit, but we know it's spiritually speaking. Now, how do some get the idea that it's men only? They get it from Matthew uh, 19. So let's look real quick there, and I realize I'm running out of time, but my points are almost done, and we'll, we'll end on this for today. I can't believe this is as far as we got, but that's okay. We're not here to race, we're here to learn, right? Matthew 19, verses 11 and 12 says, But he said to them, Not all men can accept this statement, only to those it's been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb. Okay? They just, they were sterile. Okay? There are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. They castrated them. And there were eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs, did it to themselves for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. They declared, I don't want to even have a wife because I don't want to be sidetracked by the wife. I'm just going to declare myself a, a, a virgin unto God. So we see three groups of people here. They were all males being referred to, and that's why some jump and say, here it is, they've got to be male. But does this in Matthew have to be the only way to look at it in Revelation? I don't think so. I have no problem believing in the 144,000 there are women also who God's raising up to be his spokespeople to the ends of the earth, especially because culture today has changed to so accept women in such positions. Well, there is female mutilation. Which is, uh, there is female mutilation. It yeah. just didn't direct that in right. Matthew. It was talking about the men. Yeah. Men born that way, men made that way, and men doing it to themselves. But, uh, but again, and does female mutilation... Um, Please our God? No. No. He never calls for something like that. I think that uh, it's it's rare to find a virgin man. It's not so rare to find a virgin woman. I'm not so going that's to touch that with it. <laughs> <virgin man. laughs> Pam says she believes that it's rare to find a virgin <laughs> male today, but there are virgin females today <laughs> that aren't as rare. I'm not going to go there. My point is <laughs> to, to say that. But let me show you, and you know what? I'm not going to rush through this. We'll pick back up here. We are close to finishing, but when I see it, there's a number of verses I want us to go into. My next point, I'll give you my point so you get the complete thought, and then I'll prove it next week. My next point is, this is a term used for Israel. 
we do see Israel used as a virgin presented to her God. Mm -hmm. Okay? We're going to see that Israel is the wife of Jehovah God, where the church is the bride of Messiah Jesus. Okay? We see that separation in, in the pictures that are drawn for us in Scripture. Okay? So we'll look at how this term is used for Israel. We'll look at it by the prophet Isaiah, by the prophet Jeremiah, um, and Jeremiah actually in both his books, Lamentations and his book. Um, what this does for me is give you further proof that they're Jewish. I really do believe they're Jewish evangelists. Somebody once said they're like 144,000 Jewish Billy Grahams. Mm -hmm. Oh, I Okay, but they are Jewish because they're carrying it to the Jewish people throughout the world, which brings in the net of the Gentiles also. We'll see why they're called first fruits, and we'll see that they're, they're, they are not the only first fruits. Maybe next week I won't be so tongue tied too. <laughs> but we'll see that, um, that we are first fruits of a kind. We're going to see what that means and who they are. We will see how the Gentiles enter into judgment on the basis of their relationship to the 144,000. Okay, so we've got several points. That's why I don't want to just rip through it. It's 344. I don't know where the clock goes. My favorite saying, no clocks in heaven. That's when I'll know I'm home. I won't be tied to a limit right. anymore. <laughs> we'll be able to day and night, night and day, which won't exist, but you know, we'll be able to just go on forever and ever. But um, I hope it's been a blessing for you today. We'll finish with the 144,000 the next time, and then we'll go into the Antichrist. I believe we'll manage to take the Antichrist and the false prophet. We'll see. We tend to, because of questions, and, and that's what we're here for, as long as they're on track. We tend to, to go into a larger, and there are a lot of verses. We'll look at all the names for the Antichrist so that we know when we see it in different places in Scripture how it all ties together. So it may take us the class to do the Antichrist. We'll see. But that's where we're headed. And uh, eventually, once we get through these key people, then we'll look at God's clock all the way from the end of the tribulation to eternity in the future. And who knows? From there, that God. <laughs> and all I can say is I'm not worried about my future because God is already there. In fact, my future is so bright, i got to wear sunglasses. <laughs> so um, let's close in a word of prayer. Uh, Ruth, did you need to say something first? Um, Roger, unmute Ruth real quick, and we'll see what she wants to say. Almost there, Ruth. Come here now. They, nope, it's still showing her native. Um, you want the second row, third in? You've highlighted her, hit the unmute. Uh, okay, Ruth, try it. There you go. You're open, Ruth. Okay. I just want to say I am so thrilled that you are in the first part of Revelations because I didn't come in to your class until you were in the 12th chapter of Revelation. So... This is extraordinary for me. I am so delighted, and I thank you. Well, thank the Lord. I'm glad it's a blessing to you. It is in many ways. Eventually, hopefully, we'll get those teachings up mm -hmm. on YouTube, mm -hmm. and you'll be able to get the whole. But it took us three and a half years, so it, it's going to be a lot to listen to. Is that our Ruth? That's our Ruth. Yes, that's our Ruth. Pam's saying, is that Ruth? Did I just hear Ruth? Because she can't I heard Pam too, yeah, earlier. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, let her, I'll let her come in here in a minute, but thank you for encouraging my heart that it's been a blessing. Let's oh, close, yes. We'll close in prayer, and then any who are here that want to see the others and talk to the others, come up. We'll let the interaction be there. Um, you know, we'll take it like we do at the end of class, okay? So, Lord God Almighty, God of Israel, and the God who loves each one of us, thank you for the privilege to study your word, to learn about your future plan and to know that the accuracy of everything fulfilled at this moment in time yields us to know the truth of the future that is coming. Thank you that for us it is sealed. We are yours, we belong to you, and one day, soon and very soon, we'll find ourselves home with you forever and ever. How we praise you and thank you for that, and we pray any and all who do not know that yet will hear these words of truth, of life, of hope, of all that, that, that it's everything, Lord. 
Let them come to know and understand and open their hearts to you all so that they too can have eternal life with you forever and ever. Hallelujah. We praise you. Amen and amen. Okay. All mics open. Pam, come say hi to Ruth. She wants to see you. Oh. You can see her. <laughs> I'm going to get out of the way. You've heard me enough. And, uh,